saying that people don't watch women's sports is not sexist. It's actually, we should say that out loud more often. People don't watch women's sports. This is the Token CEO Podcast. It's Thursday, June 9th. This is episode 219. Um, you can subscribe to this on YouTube. So if you are watching this, subscribe now, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. You can get anything and everything business casual. So if you have a job, you want a job, or you want to just be more casual during the work week, you can get business casual stuff at store.barstoolsports.com. You can also shop our out and about merch. So we are doing a huge push for pride. We will have a Chevy truck in the in the pride parade so if you want to join us for that i think you can go to the out and about podcast and they'll tell you how or you can just wear our merch and you can also get that at store.barstoolsports.com things we are talking about today so first let's talk about cheryl sandberg so cheryl sandberg last week stepped down as the coo of facebook she was there 14 years she took the company from 150 million dollars in revenue to a 511 I think $511 billion market cap. So deserves a huge amount of credit for that. Um, I think she's kind of a controversial character or she's a polarizing character, I guess I would say. You can't dispute that she had a massive, massive impact on the success of that company. And she deserves all of the bajillions of dollars of riches that she's going to, that she's already earned and will continue to earn from that. She's joining the Facebook board. Um, but it's also interesting where, you know, something was happening when Girl Boss launched with Sofia Amoroso and Lean In was written by Sheryl Sandberg. It was kind of like a different era of feminism, which I think women feel odd about now or they don't feel good about. Like most people I know don't like Lean In. I'm not sure why necessarily. I mean, I think the whole lean in premise is have a great partner, have him or her take half of the load and work harder and you'll be successful. Like to me, that's kind of the message of lean in. Girl boss was kind of kitschy, I think overall and just, you know, Sophia's business has failed. So that kind of created the like, well, what is a girl boss if a business is failing? I think overall, the thing on Sheryl Sandberg from everything I've read is that she just was so image conscious. Like, it sounds like her image, the PR around her was what she cared about most. And and she also built that ethos inside of Facebook. Like you look at how Facebook has handled some of their hurdles in the last, you know, five to 10 years. And they're almost looking at every issue through a PR lens, which I kind of feel like is the number one way that people distrust you when you don't solve things organically or authentically, or you're so worried about the positioning and PR, I think it kind of clouds the, the whole, I think it just clouds everything. So I don't know. I think if you were to ask before all of the Cambridge Analytica stuff and people thinking Facebook is evil, I would have said that Sheryl Sandberg was going to run for president. Um, I obviously don't think that's the case now. I think she would have a hard time doing that. I hope she goes and builds something great for women. She obviously is very successful and I think can do that. I think she's also getting married and probably wants to enjoy her life. And I would guess that that woman has done little else besides build Facebook for the last 15 years, you know, and she deserves a break. So I think the bigger question is, is when, what's it going to take for women to be at the top of more companies. And then also big question of like, what happens to Facebook? Like it's so obvious that Facebook is just chasing, chasing, chasing TikTok. I don't know that it's gonna catch up. You know, it's so funny. I had dinner with a college freshman last night and I was asking him what social media he was on. And he's on TikTok obsessively. He's on Snapchat religiously, and he's not even on Instagram. And he's like, it's so negative, it's so perfect, it's so FOMO driven that he's like, it's bad for my mental health and I choose not to be there. So long story short, we'll see what happens with Facebook and hopefully there'll be more women CEOing or COOing major tech companies. The COO of Coinbase, I think, is a woman and the CEO of Instacart is a woman. Those are two good things, two companies I like. In other news, so I don't know if anyone was, watch was watching the French Open. So Amelie Marissimo, I'm probably butchering that last name, let's be honest. So she's a former world number one. I think she won Wimbledon. She might have won the French Open. Mega, mega, mega successful 
a uh, women's tennis player. She was getting some shit because when you watch the French Open, you will notice that the there are only men's events at night. And so she came out and responded to that and said nine out of the 10 night sessions at Roland Garros this year were men's matches because women's matches currently have, quote unquote, less appeal. She was completely obliterated online for saying that. I got to say, she's not wrong. So one thing we should flash here is the pictures of the stadiums during women's matches. Okay. It's pathetic. It's so sad. It's just like pathetic, pathetic, like empty, empty, empty stands, which I just want to pause on this. Like saying that people don't watch women's sports is not sexist. It's actually, we should say that out loud more often. People don't watch women's sports. We should say it out loud more often because until such time as men and women actively, aggressively, enthusiastically, crazily watch women's sports, women's sports are not going to be a good business, period. So we can say, you know, everybody can take their moral high ground of how could you, you can't say that. That's bullshit. I think we need to acknowledge nobody goes to women's sports. People don't buy tickets to women's sports. Now, there are obviously exceptions to this. There are college teams that have obsessive followings, UConn basketball. That's a greater ticket than the UConn men's basketball team. Probably better ticket than the UConn football team. Women's soccer, right? The Olympics. Like People will watch women's sports, but by and large, they're not. And so what I feel bad for her about is, look, she's trying to run a business. So she has a certain amount of matches. She has a certain amount of TV time. She has a certain amount of money she has to hit. And naturally, they're going to put the men's matches at night because those are the most expensive tickets. Those are the longest matches and games. That's going to bring the French Open the most amount of money. So the other issue, so then she went on to explain her comments. Um, and she said that her, her quote was taken out of context. But I think this is also part of the problem. I think we should just man up or woman up and be like, hey, nobody's watching. What should we do about it? Women's tennis matches are shorter than men's tennis matches. Their TV contracts stipulate there can only be one match at night. So that so when they're looking at the total airtime or they're looking at the total value of the ticket, they're going to choose the men's matches. But what we have to get more honest about is why don't people watch women's sports? Or when when people do watch women's sports, what is it that about those sports that makes them watch? So one, I think it's kind of like female executives. So whether you like Sheryl Sandberg or hate Sheryl Sandberg, you gotta give her a lot of credit for staying on top of a company that big, having that much success for that long. I also think that in general, if you're a woman in that spot, you're probably a hundred times better than the man in that spot, just by how hard it was to get that position and to keep it. And it might be true in women's sports, right? Which is the sports that gain attention are the sports where the women's teams are just so dramatically compelling as athletes. Like they are the best, the best, the best. I think the second thing is the amount of highlights or the amount of moments that are viral or like must watch that come out of a sport. Like obviously men are bigger, there's more force, there's more violence, there's more speed, the hits are harder, the falls are greater. Are there as many of those moments in women's sports? Or two, is it a media problem where there are those moments but nobody's catching them? Which I also think could be true. I think what's hard though is like, like I had a conversation with the PWHPA people and like they're going to get things going. They're going to have a league. It's amazing. My thing to them is like it's a business. So you got to get people to buy tickets. You got to pe get people to go to the stadium. You got to get people to tune in wherever the game may be and you've got to get them to spend money and talk about the team and to create fandoms. And until we can make women's sports as compelling as men's sports or the most compelling, they could be more compelling than men's sports. Until we make that happen, women's athletics or women's sports are never gonna get the airtime, the ticket revenue, the sponsorships, the pay, like none of the downstream things will happen. And I just wish people would spend more time talking about that than having an argument about the 
the sexist nature of things. Like, yeah, should the French Open have half of the nights be men's games and half of the nights be women's games? Probably. Should the, should the French Open have every night be a women's match? I'd love that. But the reality is it's the business. So we've got to deconstruct what is it going to take to make women's sports a big ticket item for people. And if women's sports can be a good business, it can be a great business and it will be a big business. Okay, so then speaking of people being mad online, then there were, I think, 17 NBA games this weekend. Full slate, WNBA games this weekend, not one on television. The long and short of it is, I, I think there need to be more people who are thinking about what exactly has to get done to make women's sports most compelling. If we can make women's sports most compelling, right? Like I'm doing this right now with the PLL. Like the PLL guys are like, grow the game of lacrosse, grow the game of lacrosse, grow the game of lacrosse. That's all they care about. How are they doing it? They highlight the shit out of every game. It's almost like I follow the PLL and I am like in a perpetual PLL highlight reel. It's just like highlights, highlights, highlights but they've mastered it. They've done a really good job of making the game seem fast, making the game seem dynamic, making the game seem violent, making the game seem compelling, showing crazy goals, crazy saves, crazy hacks. Like they've done what it takes to make a sport stand out. They just got an ESPN contract. I have to wonder like who's running, you know, when the PWHPA creates their league, Who's going to be running the media for that league? The WNBA, who's running that media? Who's thinking about the social? Who's going to manhandle the internet to make that sport catch fire? I I think the same thing is true everywhere, right? Like people get all bitchy about this podcast. They're like, shut the fuck up. Stop, Stop the podcast. But I'm like, you know what? Showing a woman in running a company and having a business and working through that is good for all businesses and it's good for women in business. I think the same thing is true of women's athletics, which is show them, show the highlights, show the struggle, show the personal stories, show the wow moments, show the broken ankle, show the violence, show the speed, show the show the passion. And the more we can do that with higher frequency in places where you can actually get viewers, which is the internet and social media, the better off women's sports will be. Okay, so Felix Gray, let's talk about Felix Gray. I am spending all of my time on a screen these days, I feel like, even though it's gorgeous out, I've been trying to put my screens down so I can go outside and enjoy my life. But when I'm not doing that, I'm typically staring at a screen. I love my Felix Gray glasses. So what do they do? They reduce blue light. So at the end of the day, when you're like, eyes are bleary and red and they're sore and you're like, oh my God, I have a headache behind my eyes. Have you ever had a headache behind your eyes? It's a terrible feeling. Or when you're like on an eight hour flight and you've just been staring at your screen the entire time and you get off the flight and you're like, "Ah, I'm dehydrated and my, I'm blind. Felix Gray helps you with that because they mitigate the effect of blue light on your eyes. So they filter 15 times more blue, more blue light than regular glasses. So let's face it. We're all spending way too much time on screens. That's not going to stop anytime soon. You can get Felix Gray glasses that help protect your eyes because they reduce the the effects of blue light. If you go to felixgrayglasses.com slash token, that's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash token, you can get prescription or non-prescription glasses. They've got free shipping, free returns. They come in a thousand colors. I've got my green ones here. I have a lychee pair at home. I love the word lychee. They also have free exchanges and free returns. felixgrayglasses.com slash token. So the other thing I want to talk about was I had somebody DM me the other day about layoffs and I was reading, I I was reading a lot this weekend actually. And I was reading an article about all of the pending layoffs. I read a bunch of things on the great resignation and how that's over and what happens next. And I think one of the craziest things that's happening right now, which is like everything is we're having such extreme moments in such proximity to one another. Like we had the great resignation. You couldn't find people. Everybody was jumping ship. Everyone was getting a bigger, better job offer elsewhere. And then er, 
the next thing you know is like the Great Recession is coming. And so I think one of the things you're starting to see, Jamie Dimon made a bunch of comments last week about the economy. You saw Elon Musk tweeting about a whole bunch of stuff, which I actually want to get back to this weekend. Um, but the other thing that you're seeing is layoffs. So Netflix is laying off 150 people. There's a big article in Digiday this weekend about Food 52, laid off 22 people. Carvana, 2,500 people. GoPuff, 400 people. Noom, 495 people. Peloton, 2,800 people. Robinhood, 300 people. I read an article last week that Coinbase rescinded all of the offers it gave to people. So made a bunch of hires and then was like, oop, we're overheating, we're hiring too fast, rescinded all the offers. So people who had accepted jobs at Coinbase no longer have jobs at Coinbase. Cameo 87, Tesla, Tesla talked about laying off about 10% of their workforce. So long story short, there's a lot happening right now that is creating a lot of volatility and, and more importantly, a lot of uncertainty in the job market. What I would say, and myself, I'd include Barstool and myself in this, is employers and companies are getting nervous about what's ahead. I'm nervous, I, I'm nervous about what's ahead. What's going to happen with consumer spending? Are we going to be able to have a soft landing in the economy or are we going to go into a recession? Uh, if consumer spending is down, what happens to the ad business? What happens typically when employers are feeling anxious is they start to pull back. You, you know, if you talk to anyone who invests money in companies, they're like, ooh, I'm being far more judicious about where I'm putting money. You talk to anybody who runs a company, everyone is like, hey, I'm gonna slow down on hiring. I wanna be sure that the money I have in the bank stays in the bank. I wanna be sure I don't get ahead of my skis in hiring or making too many investments or making too many risks because I'm not sure where I'm not sure where the economy is going to be in six months, and I'm not sure the position my company is going to have in that economy in six months. So huge amount of uncertainty, which is causing people to, to fall back. When this happens to you or when this happens to your company, I think getting laid off can be one of the most disheartening, upsetting insecure feelings ever. I've been laid off. It is a horrible, horrible, horrible feeling, mostly because you're not in control. Like, it's not like you up and quit and we're like, fuck you, dude, I hate working for you, I'm out of here. Or it's not like you're like, hey, this job sucked, I'm on my way to a bigger, brighter future. A layoff is something that happens to you. You don't know when it's coming, you don't necessarily know what the reasons are, um, but you do know that it can have a devastating, devastating effect on your personal finances, on your self-esteem. And I don't really, I don't really believe this, but for a short term minute, you think it can have a major impact on your future. So I think the question is like, what happens if you're Peloton, you work for Peloton and you're one of the 2,800 people who are laid off? Okay. The first thing I would say on a layoff is take a break, either go get drunk if that's your thing. I sometimes like to take to my bed. So you just want to like crawl in your bed. You can have your, a 48 hour, a 72 hour. Don't go too much longer than that, but you have to have your sulk cry, feel bad for yourself, pity party, call your mom and commiserate moment, right? Like you want to wallow in what just happened to you and have all the feels about it. You don't want those feelings to inhibit your ability to move forward. So get those feelings out there. Um, if you can afford it or you have access to it, get away for a little bit, like go, go take a break and just sit in the moment of like, oh shit, my job is gone. The second thing I think you need to do is to look at your finances and you have to be honest with yourself. How much money do you have? How much credit card debt do you have outstanding? What are your major expenses and how long can you go on? How long does your severance go on? And what does that mean for you being able to pay your bills? Um, you obviously, if you're planning for a rainy day, want the money that you have to be able to stretch as long as humanly possible. I think the third thing is once you figure that out and you decide, hey, I got to move back home for a bit or I've got to take on a roommate or I've got to get out of my lease or I've got to move to a different city. like. Once you understand what your money looks like, then you understand what your options might be. Where should you live? 
How much money can you spend? You know, how do you make the most of the money that you have right now? Maybe you don't pay your credit card off. You just pay a little bit of your credit card. Maybe you get that roommate. Maybe you go live at home for a bit. And maybe you take on a part-time job bartending, right? Maybe you just do something to bring in a little bit of supplemental income. I think the next thing is... What do you want to do next? Is your resume sharp? A lot of companies offer resume services. There is no shame in taking a company up on resume services. You got to get yourself some stationery to write thank you notes. You got to get your resume in order. Um, The biggest thing I think in a resume where where that people forget about is you need somebody reading your resume really quickly to understand who you are, what you've done and how that's applicable to their business. Don't stuff the thing with too many words. Don't stuff the things with it, with irrelevant stuff. Don't make them like a buzzword bingo sheet, get your resume honed and crafted. You might have three or four versions of your resume, depending on the type of jobs that you're looking for. The next biggest thing is to network and to start to apply for new jobs and to imagine new possibilities for your future. So that's kind of my like one, two, three take on a layoff. It sucks. It sucks to lay people off. It sucks to be laid off. Um, It can be a really emotionally debilitating experience. I also think it can open up new things. You know, we don't live in the era like my grandfather worked for the same company for his entire career. Life's not like that anymore. Work isn't like that anymore. So take the opportunity to use the moment to create a change that you might have never had a courage, might never have had the courage to take, or you might not have even wanted to take, but use that time and place to put yourself on a path to get to a new future. And you can do that. You can do it by being smart about your money. You can do it by being resourceful about your outreach in terms of new jobs and by being honest with yourself about having all the feelings about getting laying, being laid off and then getting moving to making your job getting a job. The other thing you might want to do when you're thinking about what's next after your layoff and you've finished drinking all the Kim Crawford you can possibly funnel into your body or you're done taking your nap is Who do you want to reach out to for a recommendation, right? Who do you want as your reference? Um, I think a great thing to do would be to have a conversation with people who used to be your bosses or who you used to work with. Um, Reach out to them. Say, do you have anyone in your network? Could you help me? Would you be a reference for me? Do you, you know, what are your thoughts on this company, this company, this company? I think being proactive with people you used to work with, either in the job you just had or maybe in a job before that, those are great things to do. If you work with customers, it's totally appropriate to send a very thoughtful note. Do not bash the company you just worked for. Send a very thoughtful note and say, hey, I'm moving on. Loved this company, loved working, working with you. Any suggestions you have on leads would be greatly appreciated. So I think also thinking about, you know, thinking about who are all the people you're connected to in your current job or your, you know, now former job in the job before that or in the ecosystem around the job you worked for, reaching out to those folks, getting their perspective, learning what they think are interesting opportunities and leveraging them for a reference or recommendation Those are things that can help set you up for success. You don't want to be too laid back and you don't want to be too annoying either, right? It's totally appropriate to reach out to your old boss for a recommendation. If you ask five times and they say no, stop asking. You can reach out to a customer about to be a reference or to give you a referral for another job. You can ask once or twice or three times. Don't ask 10 times. So it's okay to make the outreach. Most people are busy. Most requests are never responded to, right? Like I get a thousand requests every day. I don't respond to to half of what I should be responding to. The second thing is you got to have good feel for if somebody is going to respond. So if you call somebody, you text them and you email them and they don't respond to you, they're probably not going to respond to you. Move on to the next person. When you make your job getting a job, think about your day like that. Think about who you need to call, who you need to reach out to, what you can do to your resume. Literally take, if you want to work six hours a day on getting a job, chunk up that six hours into things that you can do to set you up for the most success in the future. Talk to a career counselor. Talk to your HR people from your last company. Go on every career site you can possibly imagine. Try to network. Use the internet. 
When you do that, it will help you feel empowered. It'll help balance that bite from getting laid off in the first place. And it'll help you set it'll help you set you up for success and hopefully get you to a place where you'll have multiple options of where to work in the future. The other thing Elon Musk did, which I'm curious to people's feedback, is not only did he say he's laying off 10% of people, he also said Tesla is going to be laying off 10% of people. He also said, hey, everybody get your ass back to work. And if you don't show up, we'll assume that you've resigned. I respect it. I love it. I think it's a ballsy move. I think it's very counter to, it's not an employee friendly statement. It's kind of a take it or leave it, which I respect in that he's like, I'm not gonna dick around on, if you work from home, if you work here, I want you at work. This is a company that has people at work. If you don't wanna come to work, that's totally cool. You're an adult, that's your call but we're gonna assume you don't work here. So fascinating take. I think it's a f extremely efficient. I think it's also just reflect refreshingly blunt and it'll be interesting to see how his employee base takes it. So speaking of that, like we're just, we're not top down directed like that. Like I think if Dave or I were to say something like that, one, I don't think we would. I don't think we're very mandate-ish about where people work and how they work. That's just not our vibe and that's not our culture. We do act like that with a bunch of things. Hey, you got to promote Black Friday merch. You got to promote the bets. You know, you got to do this, that, or the other thing. I think we're, we're far more tactical about a zero tolerance policy where people need to act and do things. So I think we're more tactical like that. It's gonna be really interesting to see what happens with work, whereby we went from great resignation where everyone's essentially terrified of millennial employees. Everyone's creating more snack bars, more yoga rooms, more time for meditation, more this, more that, more perk, 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 perks to get people to work at the company. Then the economy basically overheats and now everybody's pulling back. And I think Elon is using that moment. Goldman Sachs is obviously getting people back and they've been very vocal about that for a while, where he's using that moment and a blunt force object to basically say like, get in line and if you wanna work here, these are the terms of your employment. So it's kind of to my original point of how everything is moving from one extreme to the next so, so, so quickly. But I also think it's kind of a leading indicator of that's where things are going. And the era of the perks and the accommodations and the crutches and the, the sweets and the treats may be over. And we're getting back after you know two and a half years of pandemic to, hey, work is work. And this is, what it, this is what's expected of work. And if you want a job, you live by those ex expectations. Okay, really quickly, Truebill. I love Truebill. What's awesome about Truebill is it's an app that helps you save money by getting you organized about all of your subscriptions, all of your finances. So what Truebill does is it gives you a true and pure snapshot of your finances. You can create a budget, you can understand what your expenses are, you can cancel unwanted subscriptions, you can get track of all of those measly credit cards you have lying around. So if you're looking at a layoff or you're thinking about, shit, is my company going to have a layoff or what's gonna happen with the economy? Truebill is amazing in that it gives you one place where you can put all of your financial details, you can make a budget, you maybe want to make that budget a little bit more conservative than you originally thought because you don't know what's going to happen at work or you don't know what's happening with your company. I got stuff all over the place. I got a bank account here. I got a credit card there. I don't know if everyone's like this. I have like the nagging credit card that I've had since college, which has like a running balance and I always forget to pay it. Truebill helps you get all those things organized in one place. I think they, on average, help people save over 700 bucks a year. The other thing is I feel like I'm always paying for shit I don't use. I sign up for a subscription, I never end up using it and I forget to cancel it. So Truebill helps you cancel all those subscriptions and it helps you see all of your finances in one place. All right, if you go to truebill.com slash token, you can start canceling your unwanted subscriptions and save money. You can make a financial plan and start to outline your budget. So you go to truebill.com, you can save thousands of dollars a year if you go to truebill.com slash token. All right, we're up to Q&A. So first Q&A is my boss found out I was interviewing elsewhere. Ooh, I've been in this situation. 
When asked about it, I was honest. I feel good about being honest, but do you have any other advice on this topic? I do ultimately want to leave, but feel very awkward in the meantime. This is a good question, I think. This happened to me here, where I found out that someone was interviewing, and then you're like, shit, what do I do with it as the manager? But also you have to respect like what the ultimate signal is, which is, hey, that person's not happy and they don't want to work for you. This is always just such an awkward thing because you don't necessarily want to out yourself that you're interviewing because you don't know if you're going to get a job and you don't even know if you get a job offer if you want to take that job. It's also upsetting to your boss, as you can imagine, who's like, holy shit, this person's like doing something behind my back. So it's super natural for people to go look for a job. It's super natural and it's a good thing that people want to grow their careers, make a life change, experience something new, or they've outgrown or tired of, or they don't like the company anymore. Like that shit is all super natural and good. Um, I think in this case, you did exactly the right thing, which is to be honest. You know, sometimes people often say like, hey, I was approached, I didn't reach out for the job. I have to be honest, like that whole line of talking doesn't really make matter because the net net is if you love this job so much, you wouldn't take the other call. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to take the other call. You should just be straight on like, hey, you know, this company reached out to me. I thought it was super interesting. Um, and I had a conversation. And then I, you know, I think your boss is probably going to be like, well, like what's going to come of it? And that leads you almost to the more awkward spot of now what? And I think the best thing to do is to just be super honest and as transparent as you can be in the process. If you are going through this and if you're in a position where your boss knows you're interviewing or you think your boss might know, you got to make sure your work product and your commitment is excellent. So you're still delivering things on time. You're not slipping. You're not like sloughing stuff off. You're not like delegating it. You're doing your job great. Everyone knows you're considering a change. And then I think at some point and probably very soon, it's worthwhile to have a conversation with your manager to say, hey, here's, here's what I'm learning. I love it here. I realize after talking to all these companies or this one company that there are so many great things about this place and here's what they are. What I also realized is I'm looking for something different than my current role. That could be just, this is one possible scenario. There could be all sorts of scenarios for this conversation. What I've realized is this isn't the place for me. If you say that, then you have to leave. I, what I've realized is I'm in the right company in the wrong role. Long story short, you've got to figure out like the Rubik's cube of you, your job, your company, your manager, and then have a really proactive, honest, forthright conversation on, hey, I've learned a lot in this process. I'm going to be moving on. I want to do that amicably. Or you might say, hey, I've learned a lot. I've realized I love this here. I realize I want to do more. Um, but you need to know that the same position that another company is paying you know, a third again as much, or they're paying me 10% more, or their compensation looks this way. And then I think it's fair to say, I'm really committed to staying, and I would love to have a conversation in the future about what my compensation looks like or what my responsibility looks like, all of that. So that's a very long winded, winded answer. I guess what I would say overall is it's gonna be awkward. So like buckle up for some awkwardness. Mm -hmm. um, I think the more forthright you can be in this process from here on out, the better off you're going to be, the better off your manager will take it. And then ultimately you're hopefully going to be in a position where you have a decision on do you wanna stay and double down or do you wanna go and leave this behind you? And both of those options are great ones. Okay, second question. Hi, token team. If a job posting comes up for something that would be interesting to you at a company you would want to work at and it fits your skills, but is a lower position level wise, for example, an analyst position when you are a manager, what would your advice be in terms of making that move? Ooh, this is a great question. I'm leaning toward it being worth it if I know there's room for growth, but I was curious about your overall thoughts. Thanks. 
and this person loves the podcast. That's always a benefit. Um, okay, what I would say on this one is I think most titles are bullshit and they're just like a bunch of marketing words jumbled together, which if you really deconstruct them, you don't know what they mean in the first place. So the difference in this case between an analyst and a manager, who really knows? Like, And, and also who really cares? I think what you want to find out is what are the responsibilities of this role versus the responsibilities that you have now? If the role is big enough and you have enough to chew on, I'm a big proponent of taking jobs that scare you. So if it gives you something to bite into that you think is incredible, then who cares what the title is? If you're taking a step back though, and you're going to, you know, you're managing people, you're doing all these things, and then you're taking a step back to, let's say, working in a job that in your company would work for you, then I think you have to be really, really clear about the, the growth path because ultimately that's going to be frustrating to you. You're going to have this like incredible six months in your, new, in your new gig where you're like, I'm the best at everything. I've done this before. I'm so good. But then you're going to be frustrated because you're better than your peers or your manager and your comp isn't going to necessarily reflect it and your title isn't going to ne necessarily reflect it and your position isn't going to reflect it. So I think the biggest thing Thing is put aside the title, focus on the responsibility, make sure there's growth, whether it's a step back or a step forward. I'm a big believer in that every job should scare you. I also really think when you're early or early mid in your career, sometimes shifting down in the car and making a pivot to a better company, a better industry, a better sector, a better department, that can be a really, really good move and open up a lot more opportunities for you. So I think you're on the right path. And so long as this opportunity does that for you, then go for it. Last question. Can we talk about how long the application and interview process should be? Ooh, this is a tough one. I was just rejected by a company after five rounds of interviews and one test that I passed. The whole process took almost two months. I understand this process for certain jobs, but this was a small corporation. Annoyed and confused after taking so much time off my current job to interview. How do I avoid this in the future? This is an awesome question. I think most everyone has been through this type of situation or maybe is in this type of situation. We're kind of in this situation on a whole bunch of jobs that we have here now. Um, and so what I would say is this is just one of the annoying processes of looking for a job or hiring someone for a job. There's a lot of different stakeholders. There's a lot of macro factors. Does your company have the budget that it thought it had? Is the role approved? Sometimes companies take a couple people to a approve a job and one person is holding out. Like there's a whole bunch of shit that goes into finding a great candidate, hiring a great candidate and getting that great candidate to start. So. I think all of that said, this seems like a pretty lousy process. Two months, five interviews, not a whole lot of response. That's tough. I think the, the signal for you should be, hey, maybe this company isn't totally sold on this role to begin with. And also, they weren't totally sold on you. And that doesn't mean that you're bad or you're not great or you aren't you aren't brilliant. It's like there was something off in this interview process. Um, I think you're super right to be frustrated about how much time you took, but it's also kind of the name of the game. Like every job you interv interview for, you're not guaranteed to get. Ideally, every interview process should be clean. It should be organized. It should be quick. It should be well managed. It should be highly communicative. That rarely, rarely, rarely happens because you're basically dealing with people who have other full-time jobs. You're trying to coordinate around some type of matrixed organization. Even if the company is small, there's still matrix matrixes. So I don't know that you can ever avoid it in the future. I think it is totally right that that leaves a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth from this company. But I think the best thing you can do is learn from this process what did you like about this company? What did you like about that job? What did you learn along the way? And what is it that you think made you not make the final cut for the candidate? And if you have a good sense of that, you can decide, do you care or do you not care? Maybe you care, maybe you don't care. Um, and then I think that last thing is when you go into an interview process, 
I always think it's a fair question to be like, what's your expectation for this process? How long do you think this is going to take? How many stakeholders are there in this role? Is this job approved and funded? Those are very reasonable questions to ask. And if you get good answers to those things, my sense is that you'll probably have a faster, more streamlined process going forward. All right, real quick, merch break. It's not a phase. I love this. We have sweatshirts. Enrique had the cutest little photo shoot last week. Enrique was like all dolled up in the it's not a phase. I actually want an it's not a phase sweatshirt. I think that applies to everything. We also have out and about merch. We are doing a big push with the Barstool difference. So we will have a truck in the pride parade. Uh, Joey and Pat will be there. I think they have 40 other Barstool personalities joining. They are supporting all of the proceeds from what we're doing around Pride. Go to the LGBTQ plus center in New York City. They help young adults find their way. Um, in particular, they help people um, who are LGBTQ plus who've been kicked out of home and are trying to find a safe place to live and to figure things out. So we love that organization and we're super excited to be partnering with the Pride Parade and, and participating for our first year. So if you shop the Pride collection, that's at store.barstoolsports.com. All of the proceeds go to benefit the community center in New York. Next up, we have got Lauren Bostick. Lauren Bostick is just a gorgeous creature. She just always looks gorgeous. I do not get it. She can even have a day where she looks like shit and then she kind of like turns her face to the sun puts the camera camera on her, and her eyes like get six times larger and are like, wah. So anyways, um, I like Lauren. I met her and her husband. Her husband, Michael, runs Dear Media, uh, which is a podcast network and platform. I'm a big fan of his. Um, they have a podcast on Dear Media called His and Hers. I did it I don't know, maybe almost a year ago, maybe a little bit less than. They're they're awesome. She's so smart. She's curious. I think they promote their brands better than most anyone on the internet. She's having a baby. Uh, we did this interview a while back about what makes her tick. Uh, we talked about The Skinny Confidential, which is her show. Um, she's written a book that's called Get the Fuck Out of the Sun. She has a book club that she just posted about on Instagram. We have a conversation about being a mom, being an entrepreneur, how she thinks about her business, how she manages her relationships, and what's next for her. So Lauren, um, I adore you. I follow you. I, I love your energy. You're just great. You're an entrepreneur. You, you're beautiful. You're a model. You're an influencer. You're a partner, you're a wife, you're a mom, you're expecting another baby. Like I wanna see the Rihanna like pink coat with Michael kissing you picture, that's gotta be coming up. But give a little glimpse into the life of Lauren. Like, who are you? What makes you tick? What's made you successful? What do you do? All that stuff. Yeah, I think that, that Instagram is definitely for me, like it's a very, artistic creative outlet on my Instagram feed. And then my stories, you're going to get like a little bit more real version. But if you really want like the whole, the whole kahuna, is that how you say it? Yep. You're going go to go whole enchilada, the whole enchilada. You're going to go to my podcast. So there's like different layers of the brand, which is very fitting for me because since I was born, that's always how my personality it's been. You know, people have looked at me and been like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put you in this box. Mm -hmm. And then as they get to know me, I think that they're surprised. Um, and I'm not saying in a good or a bad way, because sometimes it's a bad way sure. of what's under it. And so sure. I think, I think that that's kind of the brand you do have to do some digging. If you just look at my Instagram aesthetic, you're going to think one thing, mm -hmm. but there's a part of me that kind of likes that. I, I I'm an overshare, but I don't want to give, give it all up at once. Yeah, like, okay. I want to court the audience. Okay. And is that how you think about your Instagram? Like, do you think about it in courting your, like, how do you think about your mediums? Like between Skinny Confidential, the podcast, the business of Dear Media, your Inst, I personally like how you dole out. I feel like you, you see more of Lauren, the more you consume in the, in more places. Yes, definitely. It's, I don't give it up. You're not going to have sex with me on my Instagram feed. Like, okay, great. You're going to maybe you'll maybe we'll make out, maybe you'll feel my nipple, but like, we're not going all the way until you get to my podcast. And that's very much how my content is planned out. The product line is, is totally, uh, uh, 
baby of everything I've been through online with my jaw surgery and being puffy and gaining 55 pounds with my first baby. And we had this ice roller and this ice roller has just taken off. And so the product line is really based on depuffing and bloat. And then the podcast is the him and her aspect. So you're going to get a really raw, real oversharing conversation with not a lot of judgment. We try to show all different sides, 360 approach, whether we agree or not. We had someone on the podcast the other day that I don't agree with, but I feel like we're in this place right now. And Erica, you know what I mean by this, where it's like, we can't even have conversations with people we disagree yeah. with. And yeah, so it's terrible. Yeah. I hope I'm an example of like, you can sit down and have a cordial conversation and understand where the person's coming from. And totally disagree. Like where's a good it thing? Start? It's a great thing. So yeah. I hope the podcast is an example of that. Yep. That's incredible. And how is it, um, you know, one of the interesting pieces about you and your business. So first shout out to the skinny confidential shout out, shout out to the roller. I have bought three rollers. Three of them have been stolen. Everyone wants the roller. They use the roller. Everybody wants the roller. I'm less enamored of the woo product. I have some product feedback for you on that. I would love it. You got to have a bigger hole opening. Everything gets clogged in those things. Okay. You're also in New York where it's a little bit colder. Mm. You have to warm the bottle up a little bit and like kind of massage it. But I do agree with you. I am, oh. I'm, I'm a creative on woo. It's not my company, but I will definitely give them Pass that. that along. If you're a girl in cold temperatures and you want to hook up, it's like, we got to go like, get yeah, this I'm not going to be mis- of the things I'm massaging in that moment. The bottle is not it. So <laughs> A hundred percent. Just pass that right along. You know how to multitask as a businesswoman. Have you tried the vibrator though? No. Oh, it's the best vibrator you'll ever use. Especially when you have sex and you use the woo vibrator while you're having sex, everyone on, on, on this Skype, everyone who's listening, it is the best orgasm. It really is. Lauren, what a great tip for people listening. I don't think they were going to think, I don't think they thought they were going to get so much about one's vagina, but this is great. One of the things I love about you is you have your own business. You have your own personality. You've got your own Instagram. You and Michael, who is your husband, who I also love, who's adorable. You play in the comments. You're like the married couple version of comments by celebs. I actually love it. I think you both are curious. I think you're supportive. I think you're open-minded. And I really love what you've created with Dear Media. I mean, people ask me about other podcast businesses all the time. Like, do I like it? Do I not like it? They, I think the expectation is I'm going to shit all over somebody's company. But I actually love the vibe that you've curated and the curation of content. And then you two have made your life and your conversations a business. So how do you balance all those pieces and do you get overwhelmed by it? Do you get energized by it? Michael, Michael is your media. That is not me. I definitely give my opinion in passing and, and say, oh, that's not what I would do. Pass the catch up, like change of subject. But I, I do not do the day-to-day of your media. So that's all Michael. Michael saw white space in the industry and thought, oh my gosh, they're completely selling creative wrong, especially women. Mm-hmm. They weren't doing a 360 approach. They were just selling ad spots on a podcast. They weren't selling through their social and their Twitter and their stories. And they weren't doing these like marriage partnerships. They were doing these like one night stands. So Dear Media is all Michael. Um, I just sometimes give my opinion. And then the podcast, we do a couple times a week. We interview really interesting guests. Um, So as far as balance in my schedule goes, I'm a huge fan of time batching. So what I'll do is I will take Wednesdays to do interviews and, and conference calls and, um, you know, anything that I can do that has to do with talking. Um, and then Monday is like a day where I get my shit together, where I, I do my own to-do list. I'm being proactive, not reactive to everyone. Tuesday's more of like a touch base with my team, product line stuff. Friday, I do a bunch of photo shoots usually. So I batch what I'm doing in one day. And I'm a huge fan of setting systems to reach the goals that I want to get to. So if I have a big goal, I don't just say, I want to write another book. Like I have systems in my calendar that help me hit 
whatever it is that I want to do. And I think that that's sort of holding yourself accountable. And that's really helped me grow my brand. But are you religious? Like, are you like Wednesday is talk day? I'm, I am religious about that, but I'm also like running around with a chicken with my head cut off. Okay. Like, I, my, my favorite thing to do is to be creative. I'm a creative person at heart. Yep. Um, I like sitting in an office behind a computer all day. Like I could not do that. I have to, yep. I have to be creating, um, or I feel like I'm not fueling what I need to be fueling. So the creative part is incredibly important to me. And I make sure I have creative blocks in my calendar. I'm not as, anal, I'm not as anal and organized though. Michael is actually way more organized and anal. Like I've never ever booked a plane ticket. Like he is very organized. With okay. all planning. Like he's more type A than me. He seems more type A. Oh, way he's more type a. in a, in a nice way. Not like in an, in your face. If you don't have a system, I think you're a loser type of way, but in like, he's quietly fastidiously organized. I think. Well, you know, I'm sure with you and Dave too, like there's certain things Dave does that you don't do and certain things. Totally. Yeah. You can't have two, you can't have two of the same people. Right. I, and I think I the audience that. that's listening probably when they, if they're married, it, it makes it work when it's two. I think it make, there's more synergy. Yeah, that's right. Um, how do you, did anyone teach you how to make your system or did you make a system that works for you? Like how how did you, how did you figure out what works for Lauren? I am a very curious person by nature. I'm a, a really big reader. I read everything I can get my hands on, but I also at the same time, don't want to be a forever student. So I actively execute what I read. And I think that's really important if you're listening and you have all these ideas, if you're just consuming all this content all the time and you're not actually putting it into action, mm -hmm. that's a huge missing piece. So I think reading a lot of different books, I'm a big fan of consuming podcasts whenever I have downtime. I like podcasts that get my wheels spinning. Yours is great. I love your podcast. Anything that's going to make, make me uh, better, quicker, faster, optimized. Mm -hmm. I love, um, and you know, for a living, I get to pick some of the smartest, most intelligent, interesting people in the world's brain. Like it's like yeah. going to coffee with someone. No one, no one's going to go to coffee with me for two hours if I just text them, but they'll come on our podcast. So like yeah. that's been incredible. Um, I'm just a fan of, of being the best version and I'm nowhere like near right now, but I'm just saying like being the best version of myself in, in all different areas and really optimizing things. So like some quick books to read if you're trying to set up systems is like Tools of the Titans is a great one. Atomic Habits, everyone loves. It's quick, it's easy. It's, it's how to form habits, stack habits. Um, I love the one thing, just like these books that are out that you see all over Instagram have so many great tips. Mm -hmm. And then who do you follow on Instagram? Like who's your favorite follow? This is so random. My favorite follow is Robert Green. Okay. He, like this incredible author. He wrote 48 Laws of Power, Laws of Human Nature. He's so smart and self aware. And I, uh, the quotes he puts up just blow my mind. And he's taught me all about human nature and how to deal with people. And I just really respect his page. But then, like, if I want something funny, I love like Heather McMahon, not skinny, not fat. She's hysterical, but I will say I am very careful of the content I consume. I like, I don't watch everyone's Instagram story. I don't want to look at it. I want to focus on building my own content and my own brand. And mm -hmm. I think you say, Oh, like it's 30 seconds of your day. Like who cares? But 30 seconds of my day for three years adds up. Sure. Sure. So I'm like very thoughtful about whose content I'm consuming. For instance, like I'll, I'll have one go-to for wellness. I love Melissa Wood health, you know, so yep. I'll like look at her stuff, but then I'm not going to look at 40 other wellness pages. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. You are, you, you make things digestible, right? Because you're like, I want to glean whatever I, I want to be inspired or I want to glean information out of this. And then second, you're not redundant. Like you're not going to waste your time on the me too's of there's five fitness experts or five inspirational quote guys or whatever that may be. Talk a little bit about failure, Lauren. So, you know, how do you, how do you think about failure? How do you think about obstacles? How do you get past them? 
So when I first started content 13 years ago, I was a bartender and I had literally no money. I was sleeping on my godparents, like guest bed, like I, I really like my card would get declined. I had, I didn't have a credit card. I was living off like cash that I made at night. And so I think when I was put in that situation, I blogged every day for three years, seven days a week and did not make $1. So I had to work. And I always tell people like, people are like, oh yeah, like go intern for all different people and see who you like. I'm like, no, go do a service industry job yes. at night and then work on your craft. So by During the, the day, day make your money at night and you learn how to engage with people and talk and listen and tell stories and multitask. The restaurant industry is such a great business for people who want to be entrepreneurs because then during the day, you're able to work on what you actually want to work on. So I was able to do that, but, but for three years, there was, there was no income from Skinny Confidential. So I think that that had its own set of challenges looking back, like wouldn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, there's challenges every single day in business employees. Like th that's been a real mind fuck for me because I was a solopreneur for six years and then that changed into yeah, an now there's all these people it's, and I'm used to like doing things how I want to do it. And mm -hmm. then you, you get more people involved. It's more opinions. So that's been challenging. I think also the procrastination and resistance, like against doing stuff is, is a challenge daily. Mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. Um, I, I find, I find business just to be a challenge every single day. There's yeah, it's, every day is every day. different. Yeah. yeah. I, but I feel like I am the type of person that like, give me anything. Don't give me boring. And I could not just have this like flat growth. I, there's been no epiphany in my career where something happened and it was huge. It's been like a slow yeah. exponential thing. As most things are, I think, I think that's like the, that's what's hard about the Instagram of it all is it looks so perfect and finished and packaged. And you're like, wait, behind this, it's a hot mess. And it's been so incremental for so long. And that's why I think with, and you do this with your podcast too. It's like, you, you can look inside my closet in my bathroom and see all the shit that's everywhere, like on the podcast. That's um, right. It, and it's like, not about the way you look like no one gives a shit how you look on a podcast. I love that. So yeah. it, the Instagram, you get the pretty stuff and I'm like creative with that. And that's fun. But then there's like a whole different side of creativity on a podcast that I think is really unique. And I think it's also weeded out people who maybe don't have a personality, meaning I think 10 years ago, everyone was following the girl in the street with the wind blowing. And like, that was the influence. And now to me, I'm more interested in like, who are you? What makes you tick? What are you sharing? What's your content? And that is from a podcast. So yeah, I sure. you listen differently now Yeah, and you watch differently. Um, Lauren, tell people where they can find you, where to get skinny confidential, what to buy. You've got all these projects moving, like give people just a sense of how to find you and be part of what you're doing. If you want pretty in pink, follow my Instagram at Lauren Bostick. If you want more real deal, our podcast, Erica has been on our podcast. It's an incredible episode. It's the skinny confidential him and her. And then the product is shop skinny confidential.com. Awesome. Lauren, thank you so much. You are awesome. Thank Congratulations. You. All right. So that's it for today's episode. Thank you for listening. I'm wearing a Travis Matthews shirt. We have the Travis, Ma we have the Travis Matthews guys in here. I'm doing something with them called Life on Tour. And they've just launched a women's line, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, you can subscribe to Things You Missed. I actually was reading The Water Coolest this morning. I don't know if you guys read The Water Coolest. Tyler Morin is a very good writer. Um, so if you haven't subscribed to The Water Coolest or to Things You've Missed, uh, you can do that by going to barstool.link slash TYM. You can follow us on social. You can subscribe to this podcast. You can leave us a rating or a review. And we'll see you next week. Bye.